and uh, we are talking with Dr. Richard Silberstein, who is in the in the studio with us. He is uh, uh, not only has a PhD in neuroscience and teaches it uh, to uh, science students, medical students, but is also the founding director of the Brain Sciences Institute at Swinburne University in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, one of the inventors of steady state topography. Richard, uh, take some more calls here. All right. Okay, Drew in Portland. Drew, you're on the air. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, first, I'd like to thank Dr. Silverstein for his work in this area. I think it's definitely the future, and it's where we should have been the whole time before we started this whole doctor drug routine, which I can tell you firsthand is not what a creative person needs. Mm -hmm. um, I've... Um, I am one of those uh, manic depressive artists, creative types who had trouble learning in the traditional format, and um, I find myself, you know, now in this economic situation where it's 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 very hard to make a living as an artist. It seems like with the destruction of the middle class. Um, your kind of your market is also eliminated mm -hmm. um, as everyone's scrambling to yeah. excellent point survive. Drew. is there a, is there a question in there well I guess my um, I didn't really have a question as much as um, a statement about in your book screwed how um, you talk about when there is a middle class especially like in the late 1700s how there there is a um, a renaissance that can emerge if mm -hmm. people are allowed. A creative renaissance, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and in the nineteen sixties as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's um it's pretty clear to see and I, I just think it's um it becomes very sad when poor families who have these children are not able to attend to their needs or yeah. even spend time exploring this because no, they're no, I, I, struggling. I, I get it and absolutely agree with you, Drew. Um, Drew, and thank you for the call. Richard, uh, Dr. Silverstein, uh, Drew made a point about bipolar disorder, ADHD, creativity, um, and of course we we're, we can't diagnose and offer medical advice to individuals on the radio, but um, I was fascinated in our conversations yesterday uh, I've been taking fish oil capsules for years. I find, I, you know, the and and actually this vegetable oil uh, omega threes that, mm -hmm, that you can right. actually that I took for a number of years when I was just a absolutely rigid vegetarian. Um, that also have the omega threes. Uh, do you would you routinely recommend that to people broadly? I mean, is it the, do you take these things? Is this uh, the answer is yes and yes. I would. Uh, what you've got to realize is that the Western diet of the last 100 years has changed dramatically. The omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil, which are the anti-inflammatory um, uh, uh, compounds, mm. versus the omega-6 fatty acids, which are pro-inflammatory. Now, you need both, but the ratio used to be you had more omega-3s than omega-6 over 100 years ago. Because mm. of the way food is processed, refined, that ratio is completely reversed now. Hmm. And uh, the the intake is much too low. It, it's essential for so many functions, uh, not just the brain, the cardiovascular system, mood as well, mood stabilization as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd I've, strongly recommend it. M my mother has Alzheimer's, and I've I you know dig, did a lot of digging into that. And there's some speculation that it it is an inflammatory process, or at least some forms of dementia are, and that if a person throughout their life takes uh, fish oil or another source of omega threes that and 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 keeps down the omega sixes in their diet that they don't develop these forms of dementia. Are you familiar with that as a neuroscientist? Uh, yes, uh, inflammation seems to be a, a culprit in many disorders now: cardiovascular disease, aspects of cancer, as well as dementia. Mm -hmm. uh, many of these are multifactorial disorders, but certainly inflammation is a crucial one. And the omega threes are just so important in so many areas. Yeah, remarkable. Uh, Don and Eugene. Hey, Don, what's up? Hey there. Hey, first off, Tom, I have to thank you again for uh, having on your website the questionnaire that for the first time showed me what was going on with my own brain, which is uh, being a creative hunter-gatherer shaman in a farmer's world. I have uh, three or four real quick questions. Pick um, one, Don, because we've got, <laughs> I've got a dozen people here on hold who want to get in, and we have very little time. One, one good question. Sure thing. Um, 
<clears throat> I've been doing uh, the lens technique work with uh, with a doctor down here in Eugene, and we mm-hmm. discovered um, some of the stuff that was going on by uh, QEEG, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on those particular techniques and also, well, actually on the cerebellum work of uh, the door technique. Sure. Like You're, these are, these are uh, techniques of, yeah. uh, well, you can explain. Uh, Look, I can't comment much about the, 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 door, the door technique. I know relatively little about it, just a, but certainly the QEG, uh, that is quanti- that's EEG using computers, quantified, mm-hmm. and uh, particularly a technique known as neurotherapy, or sometimes used to be called EEG biofeedback, right. seems to be particularly effective. Uh, it takes a bit of a while, but uh, essentially the brainwave patterns of people with ADHD is different. There's more slow wave activity than fast wave, and essentially you can teach the brain to change its pattern of brain activity and the symptoms improve quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. Uh, The ability to focus seems to improve without compromising the capacity for creativity as well. There's a there's a woman here in Portland, Nora Gagoudis, who has a clinic in Portland who does EEG work, uh, which is, you know, train your brain with your own brain waves. And when we first moved here and I started doing a morning show and I had to go to sleep at 7 p.m. and get up at 3 a.m., I couldn't sleep. I couldn't make myself go to sleep. And I went in, and she hooked me up to her machine, and over the course of about six weeks, going in once or twice a week, taught me how to help myself get to sleep and get a good night's sleep. And one of the things that I found was that it also helped me learn how to focus. I'm, I'm a big fan of this stuff. Yeah. It, yeah. it actually works. I've seen it on, my, in, on myself. Robin of Phoenix, Arizona. Hey, Robin, you're on the air with, uh, with me and with uh, Dr. Richard Silverstein. Yes, hello, gentlemen. It's great to talk to both of you. I have a, a very brief story. Um, I have a history, a family history of ADHD, from my mother to my brother to me to my son. Um, The first three of us were quite able to handle it. We functioned well in what they call quote-unquote normal society. However, my son um, had it worse than we did. All through the school years, I battled with the schools. They said medication. I said no. Um, It it became a very trying, and as you can probably hear from my voice, a very emotional experience. Mm. He is now 25 years old. Um, When he was in high school, I put him in an alternative high school because they would not modify any of the schedules. Everything was be a normal child or forget it, we're not going to deal with you. I put him into an alternative high school wherein he did um, independent study of modules, learning things, which is what I knew he needed because he told me that when he was a child, he said, when I learn these things and I know them, why do they expect me to do 50 problems? And I used to sit in the classrooms to see what the problem was, and he would be on page 454 when the class was on was studying page 10. Mm-hmm. Um, to get to the point, um, he graduated from high school. Um, when he took his SATs and his ACTs, they called me. The high school principal said, could you come in? We need a meeting. Um, he said that, that my son graduated. He had the top, he, he had the top 3% of scores in the entire nation on his SATs and ACTs. And I said, well, now you well realize what my, um, all of my angst and frustration is with um, all of the the schools that won't modify any programs. So to get to the point, um, he is now, my son is 25 years old. He's super, super smart. Um, I'm not really sure what to do at this point. He will not, he took himself off of medications years ago. He said, I don't need these medications. They just destroy what I am, his words. Mm Um, He now lives on Social Security, lives in a studio apartment, and has pretty much rejected people because the teachers were rotten, the principals were rotten, the kids rejected Mm -hmm. him. And I'm wondering how best to help him. He has all of this intelligence, brain power, um, drive, creativity. No, I I, I get it, Robin. What do I I do? I have. Uh, uh, thank you for the call, Robin. I, 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 first of all, we can't offer specific advice for, to Robin, but I have seen so many kids like this. This is one of the reasons why we started the Hunter School at HunterSchool.org was to prevent this kind of thing ha- from happening. We saw the same thing happening with one of our kids who we put in a private school. And, and my call, and, the, and actually the last book I wrote, The Edison Gene, uh, talks about this at length, uh, as does uh, Tom Hartman's Complete Guide to ADHD, a whole chapter for teachers. We need to reinvent our schools. Mm. Richard, your thoughts? Uh, I, cu- I couldn't agree more. I, and I think the, the point that the, the, the caller made about um, the capacity of uh, individuals to learn on an independent basis, more b- learning by, by action, by doing, in many cases, uh, using their own initiative seems to make mm-hmm. an enormous difference. And if that could somehow be sustained outside of the schooling environment and continuing, I think it would be of enormous value. In, in many ways, 
these sorts of individuals do very well when initiative is, is essential. So, for right. example, even in a research environment where you're no longer just soaking in information from the teachers, but you actually have to think and work out what you're going to do independently, that's when they seem to flower. Uh, mm. And I'm sure the same thing happens out in, in the, the world outside the universities as well. Right. So for, for an, an adult who got beaten down by the school system and is not doing so well as an adult as a consequence of it, uh, you know, broadly speaking, my advice would be find your passion. Precisely. You know, find Precisely. something that interests you. Find something that engages you. If you can't make a living at it, volunteer for a while. Eventually, if you get really good at it, you'll be able to make a living at it. <laughs>